In this video, I'm going to build on what I talked about in Breakthrough 12, where I said that we create these selves in the subconscious mind. And they become almost like a living entity, and they actually want to prevent us from growing to a higher level on the spiritual path. So an essential aspect of the spiritual path is to become aware of this and to learn how to free ourselves from these selves. And I also explained that one aspect of freeing ourselves from a self is to overcome the energy that's created uh, through the self. We have a stream of high frequency energy, love based energy, that's flowing from our higher selves into our identity minds, our mental minds, our emotional minds. And as the energy passes through these selves, it's like they are being colored. You can say that the self is like a film strip. In a movie projector, you have a light bulb that produces pure white light, but as the light passes through the film strip, it takes on the colors and the shapes of whatever is in the film strip, and then it's projected onto the screen. So you can say that our higher self is like the light bulb in the movie projector, and the screen is our movie screen is our conscious minds, and there are three film strips, one in the identity, mental, and emotional minds. And so as the light passes through it, by the time it reaches our conscious minds, it's been colored by these selves. <clears throat> and so I also said that the low frequency energy, the fear-based energy, uh, can't flow back up to our higher selves, so it starts accumulating in the emotional, mental, and identity minds. And the effect of the energy is that, number one, it forms a veil. If you start looking into your subconscious mind, looking for a specific self, or looking for why do I react this way, then you will, you'll have to penetrate that veil. And of course, the denser the veil is, the more difficult it is to see the self and the illusion behind it. So the more you remove the energy, the more easier it becomes for you to see the self and overcome them. The other effects of the energy is that it pulls on your conscious mind. The example I used was if you have a lot of anger energy in your emotional body, you are more, uh, you're more liable, likely to uh, react with anger to many situations. And so the question now becomes, how do we free ourselves from this low frequency energy that has accumulated in our energy fields? And seeing how to do this is actually very simple, because science has um, explained this in a field called wave dynamics. So basically here you have some low frequency energy, a pool of low frequency energy in your emotional mind, for example. And the way to be completely free of it is to direct a wave of higher frequency energy into the low frequency energy. That will raise the vibration of the low frequency energy. However, this isn't the only way to free yourself from low frequency energy. And because people don't understand what I'm going to be talking about here, um, you see a lot of uh, therapies out there that are that have a different approach to freeing people from energy, and that is that you release the energy from your mind. So people have been exposed to trauma, and they go into various forms of therapy, and they learn how to release the energy, release the emotional energy. And I'm not saying that isn't valid in certain situations to help people overcome trauma, but I'm a spiritual person. So I'm here not just to raise up myself, but actually to improve the entire planet, and I don't want to have some energy that I have created in my energy field and just release that. Because what happens when you release energy from your personal energy field? Well, as we have a personal energy field around our bodies, it became obvious to me that we, there's also a collective energy field around the planet. So there's a collective emotional body. And if I am releasing anger energy from my personal field, I'm just releasing it into the collective where it can affect other people. And in, in, in fact, the, the energy accumulated in a collective field pulls on everybody's mind. So I don't want to just raise myself. I want to raise the planet. So I want to find a way to transform the energy in my energy field. And as I said, the way to do that is to get access to high frequency energy that comes from the spiritual realm. When you direct that, high frequency energy into the accumulated energy, you transform it and it flows back up. And then you lighten the load, not just for yourself, but for the entire planet. So the question now becomes, where do we get 
this high frequency energy from? And you could say yes from the spiritual realm, but there's more to understand about that. And it's not my intention with these videos to say that there's only one way to do things. It's not my point to, to say that there's only one spiritual teaching that everybody should follow. But I can only speak based on my own experience. So, you know, when I was in a meditation movement, meditation can give you access to high frequency energy. Visualizations, uh, chanting, there are various techniques out there, uh, many different techniques for how you can access high frequency energy. And if you find some that works for you, by all means, use them. But what I want to describe here is the technique that I found that I have used now for over 40 years and it's been extremely effective and extremely transformative for me. But in order to explain it, I want to give a little bit of background because I think it's important to understand the dynamic we are dealing with when we are spiritual people. So one of the transformative experiences I had when I was a child, was I was probably 11 years old, 10, 11 years old. I learned in school that 500 years ago in Europe, most people believed the earth is flat and it's the center of the universe. And this shocked me. I mean, it really shocked me because obviously today we know that the earth is not flat and the earth is not the center of the universe. So how could it be that everybody believed in the solution? And of course, my mind always works that I step back from things and look at it. So the thought that came to me was, well, but how are people going to look at our society in 500 years when they look back? Are they going to see that some of the things we believe in today are just as primitive as the idea that yours is flat? And of course, I'm convinced that that's the case. And since I found the spiritual path, of course, I have expanded my awareness and come to see a lot of the things, a lot of the illusions that I was brought up to believe in. I've come to see through them and see a higher understanding. So what I'm trying to say here is that the question we can ask is, when everybody believed the earth was flat, was the earth flat? Was the earth flat 500 years ago? Well, of course not. It was as round then as it is today. So what does that mean? It means that there are certain basic facts of life that are not changed by human opinions and beliefs. We can believe the earth is flat, but it doesn't make the earth flat. And this is important because how else do we progress? What has been the progression of humankind? We have come to know certain facts that are independent of our beliefs and therefore we have adjusted our worldview according to these basic facts. So, <clears throat> This means we have come to understand that there are certain laws in the universe. Science calls them natural laws. I would like to call them cosmic laws or spiritual laws. And one of the most important of these spiritual laws is the law of free will. You can say, what is the purpose of life? Well, from a spiritual perspective, the purpose of life is, at least, you know, from a certain level, it's the growth in consciousness, our growth in consciousness. How do we grow? We grow by making choices, experiencing, experiencing the consequences of those choices. And then we can adjust our consciousness so we can make better choices in the future. So the whole purpose of life is that we have free will. Now I know very well that for thousands of years philosophers have been debating do we have free will? Today many neuroscientists claim we don't because they can see the brain reacts before the conscious mind and all of these things. But that's a longer discussion and I will take another time. To me the essential question here is not do we have free will but how free is our will? And what we can see now is that the more of these uh, subconscious cells we have, the less free our will is. Because the cells pull us into a certain reaction. And that means that our conscious minds, the conscious self, is not free to choose its reaction. It's a self that takes over. So therefore we can see that if we want to be free, if we want to free our will, we have to get rid of these subconscious selves. Okay, so when we look at planet Earth, we can see, I think most people will agree that it's a low planet. I mean, there are a lot of problems on Earth. 
And I'll talk more about that also in the coming video, but why is the planet the way it is? It's because we human beings, humankind, we have collectively co-created the current conditions. We have created the disharmony, the conflict, and all of these things we see in society. And that shows you something important about free will. Free will is absolute in the sense that self-aware beings with free will must be allowed to make any choice they want, any choice they can imagine, and then see the consequences. So this is the sort of the alpha aspect of free will. We must be allowed to make any choice we can imagine so we can see the consequences. But there's an omega aspect of free will, and that is that we must also be able to free ourselves from any choice we made in the past. In other words, why did we make a certain choice in the past? Because it was an expression of our level of consciousness. How can we free ourselves from that? By raising our consciousness to a higher level so we can make a more aware choice. This is the basic dynamic of how growth happens and the purpose of the entire universe is growth. So this means what? Well, what have I actually explained about these selves and in my earlier talks also about the ego? The selves can turn your mind into a closed system. And I'll talk more about this later, but one effect of the selves is, of course, there's something you don't see. So we look at uh, our present world. We have many people who believe in a traditional religion. We have many people who believe in scientific materialism. They are actually somewhat similar because they both say, we are alone here on earth. We are separated here on earth. Materialism says there is no God, but what do the three main monotheistic religions say? They say there is a God, but it's the remote God up there in the sky. You, we as, as human beings are separated from him. There may be a certain priest class that have contact with this God, but you as an ordinary, normal human being, you can't contact God directly. You are separated. We are separate beings. And this has become a self-reinforcing illusion. And this is the effect of these subconscious selves. Once you have created a certain self, for example, I used the example of you're exposed to a bully. And you create a self based on, I'm powerless. Every time that self kicks in and takes over your reactions to abusive people, it's reinforcing the sense that you are powerless. Because the self can only react the way it was programmed to react. So you can have people who, in early childhood, they're exposed to a bully, and they create this self, I'm powerless, and they go through life, and situation after situation after situation validates the belief that they're powerless. So they, they reinforce the self, more and more energy accumulates in the self, and as a result, by the time they leave embodiment, they feel even more powerless than when they came into embodiment. So what I'm saying here is, the effect of free will is that we can create basically any self we want, and the selves can become self-validating, self-reinforcing. So you have to ask yourself, well, how can we ever get out of this? If the law of free will says that... <clears throat> You have to be able to free yourself from any choice you make, then how do we get out of this? How do we break this spiral, this circle, this catch-22, this enigma, this Gordian nut? And the law of free will states, and it, I have said it before, you know, an, an aspect of the law of free will says, when a student is ready, the teacher appears. And the law really says, when you are ready, to change yourself, when you are ready to change your consciousness, to raise your consciousness, you must be presented with a teaching that can help you do that. And that is why you found your first spiritual teaching, that's why you found this video and you have watched these long videos with this guy talking and talking, because you are ready for change. And what this means is that the cosmic law is set up to help us make that change. 
you, you can say that planet Earth is a schoolroom. And there are two ways to learn in schoolroom Earth. One is the school of hard knocks. This is where you're not seeking to change yourself. You are colored by your separate selves. And the, the separate selves, as I said, are always projecting that the problem is out there. So you are trying to change your own state of mind by changing outer conditions. That's the school of hard knocks. Because you always run up against other people who are doing the same thing. So you want them to do what you want, and they want you to do what they want, and it can only be a conflict. So that's the school of hard knocks. And in the school of hard knocks, people can still change, they can still grow, but it usually happens by them coming to some kind of crisis situation where they just can't keep doing what they have been doing, so they finally become open to somehow changing. So that's the school of hard knocks. The alternative to the school of hard knocks is what is represented by spiritual teachings, spiritual movements, but even uh, psychology and various forms of therapy. And it's basically, it's the school where you are looking at yourself. Instead of seeking to change other people, you're seeking to change yourself. Instead of looking out, you're looking into your own state of consciousness and saying, what can I change? Regardless of what is the state in the world that I don't have power to change, what can I change? And you can change inside yourself which is, as I've now explained, overcoming these selves. So what that means is that according to the cosmic law that guides Earth, there has to be an alternative to this self-reinforcing illusion created by the separate selves. And there are various alternatives, of course. There are various outer teachings. Uh, the Buddha gave teachings 2,500 years ago. Jesus gave teachings 2,000 years ago. There are many other teachings that have been given throughout the ages. But there is a certain progression in this release of teachings. And as humankind raises its consciousness, more and more advanced, effective uh, teachings can be released. But where are the teachings coming from? I hinted at it before that um, there can be many valid spiritual teachings so where are they coming from? And the uh, awareness that I came to actually back in early 1980s was that there must be a group of spiritual teachers who exist in the spiritual realm. And these teachers are assigned to assist us who are still in embodiment, free ourselves basically from our own minds, from our own uh, subconscious selves. And that's their goal. And their entire purpose, the entire purpose for the existence of these teachers is to assist human beings. Now, when people are in the school of hard knocks and are projecting out, these spiritual teachers can't help them. So that's why they just have to wait until people come to that point where they're open. But when you are on the spiritual path, these teachers are seeking to work with you and help you. And you individually, you have at least one such spiritual teacher, perhaps more, that you are working with personally. They are assigned to you and they worked with you before you came into embodiment, creating a certain plan for what you wanted to accomplish in this lifetime. And um, they can be called different names. I'm not saying there's only one name, but the name that I found back in the 1980s was Ascended Masters. And the name indicates, first of all, they have ascended. What does that mean? Well, I said oh, it's a schoolroom, and most schools, they have a final exam. You graduate. And so you gradually raise your consciousness on earth. You come to the highest level of consciousness you can attain on earth, and then you ascend to the spiritual realm. Now you don't have to come back into embodiment. You have uh, permanently passed the initiations of earth, so you can ascend and stay in the spiritual realm. And how do you ascend? How do you raise your consciousness? By mastering your own mind. That's why I think Ascended Masters is the descriptive name. So once you have ascended from Earth, you have two options. One is you can move on you know, to other realms. In the spiritual realm, there are, there's even more variety than there is in the physical universe. So you can move on to all kinds of things for your personal growth. But there's a certain group of Ascended Masters that have chosen to stay with Earth. And they are the teachers that are assigned to help us. And it's important to understand that the Ascended Masters are universal. They can't be confined to a particular teaching or a particular movement. There is 
There is no spiritual movement that has ever been given a patent on the ascended masters. The, the masters seek to work with many things. They've inspired many different teachings. They've inspired science, culture, various psychology, uh, therapies, all kinds of things, because they are always seeking to help people. But they have also, especially in the last hundred years, they have made their existence known more directly. They have trained certain people to take messages from them and bring forth teachings. So over the last hundred years, there have been several movements that have uh, had this, you might say, direct revelation from the Ascended Masters of various teachings. And as a result of this uh, revelation, progressive revelation, we might say, because it progresses as humankind's consciousness is raised, the Ascended Masters have given us quite a lot of techniques and tools for invoking spiritual energy. And as I said, there are other ways to get spiritual energy, but how, whichever way you get energy from the spiritual realm, it happens through the Ascended Masters, even if you are not aware of it. Uh, even if you use some technique that doesn't talk about Ascended Masters at all, it's still coming from them. And the reason for this is very simple. The Ascended Masters have the responsibility to guide the growth of the planet. And a, an important aspect of that is energy. Now, to take an extreme example, uh, when I was a child growing up in Denmark, I, of course, learned about the Second World War, the Holocaust, the concentration camps, and Hitler. And I was very disturbed by watching some of these uh, videos of Hitler. In the 1930s, he had these mass rallies. 100,000 people in the stadium, and he was up there on the podium giving his angry speech, and people were screaming, you know, Heil Hitler, and they were worshipping him like a god. Now, why did Hitler do this? Well, because whatever you do on earth, you need energy. But if you are completely selfish and self-centered, like Hitler was, and if you are deliberately seeking to harm other people, like Hitler did, you can't receive energy directly from the spiritual realm. Because the Ascended Masters will not give energy to a person who is abusing it for selfish or destructive purposes. So where do you then get energy from? You need to get it horizontally. You need to steal it from other people. And this is exactly what Hitler did. Hitler was an energy vampire. He got these people to go in there, work them up into this fever pitch where they were worshipping him, and they released a tremendous amount of psychic energy. This had two effects. It gave Hitler personal power, and that's why he could literally hypnotize many of the people around him, but it also gave a certain uh, power to the German army. If you look at the Second World War, the first couple of years, the German army seemed invincible. They just rolled over every other army. But then after a couple of years, they started slowing down. Now they didn't win all the time, and they eventually had to start losing. Why? Because in the beginning, they were running on this energy that the German people had collectively collectively given to Hitler and his war machine, and it started running, they started running out of it, and that's when they started losing. So I got sidetracked, but what I wanted to say is, is, is simply this, that the Ascended Masters are overseeing how much energy is released from the spiritual realm to human beings. And human beings who abuse it for selfish purposes will receive just a minimal amount of energy to keep them conscious. But when you are starting to um, become less selfish and self-centered, when you are working on expanding your own state of consciousness and raising the vibration of the planet, you will receive more energy from the Ascended Masters. And that's why the Ascended Masters have given us these tools where we use the names of Ascended Masters to invoke the flow of energy. And we also use these tools to, to give... to give direction and focus to the energy we are invoking so we can direct it into whatever energy we are aware of, in, for example, in our emotional minds. If you have fear, you can direct energy into that fear-based energy, transform the fear-based energy, and you free yourself from it. And again, there's various ways to do it, but the one that I found back in the early 80s was uh, where you use the spoken word. You, are, you, are, you have certain... Uh, techniques. Some of them are called decrees. It's a verse that rhymes and it's, you give it with a certain rhythm and there's a certain power in it 
And you also have others that are more like invocations where you can have a statement that asks the master to direct the energy into a specific area and then there's a rhythmic verse. So you have an interplay of both the rhythmic and the direction. So there are many, many of these techniques. I first found them through my second spiritual movement. And in the beginning, I was very hesitant about using them because meditation was natural. You know, I, I was always very shy as a child, didn't want to bother other people. But when I'm sitting there with my eyes closed and being quiet, it's not bothering other people. But now you're supposed to speak aloud that can be heard by other people. Wow, other people can hear me, you know. And I felt very shy about doing this. But I remember the first time I did it, I was, um, I was home alone, I closed all the windows, I was sure nobody could hear me, and then I started giving these decrees very, with a low voice and very hesitantly. But after I had repeated these decrees just a few times, I could feel the energy flowing. I could literally feel a flow from above, from the Ascended Master I was invoking, into my fall lower bodies. So I had an immediate response there that I am actually invoking energy. But then I started doing it on a more regular basis, and um, this had several effects. Uh, first of all, when I was a child, as many spiritual people, I was very sensitive. I could sense um, negative energy. There were certain places I could feel that had a negative energy. Graveyard, a bar, uh, some... Uh, museums with skeletons and all of this stuff. So I was sensitive to this. And I was very sensitive all of my life. And one of the things you can do when you are invoking energy from the Ascended Masters is that there's, there's an Ascended Master called Archangel Michael. And his primary task is to protect people, which first of all means protect our energy fields. So you can invoke energy from Archangel Michael that forms a shield around your personal energy field. And that means you are less susceptible to energy coming from the outside, for example, from the collective consciousness. And this was tremendously effective for me. I, I could feel how uh, my mind became much more calm after having done this just for a few days, a few weeks. Um, then there was another type of energy. There's a, a master called the Elohim Astrea, and she has this energy that's very efficient for cutting you free from any ties you have. It can be ties to other people. It can be ties to certain um, pools of energy in the collective consciousness and other things that I'll talk about later. And I had all of my childhood, I've had a problem falling asleep. Uh, when I lay down, close my eyes, I would have all of these thoughts come, all of these emotions would come up. And I, they would go around and around in my mind. It was really obsessive compulsive. And I would lie there tossing and turning for two or three hours before I was so exhausted, I finally fall asleep. But I have to get up the next morning, so now I haven't gotten enough sleep, so I'm tired all day. But despite the fact that I'm tired, when I go to sleep, the whole thing repeats. But after giving this decree to Astrea regularly for, I think, five, six weeks, I, it suddenly hit me one day, I don't have a problem falling asleep anymore. I could fall asleep within 10-15 minutes, and it's basically been that way ever since. Then there was, there was a third type of energy, which is actually the most efficient for transforming fear-based energy. And there's a master called Saint Germain, who has released the knowledge of a specific type of energy called the violet flame. And it's very efficient for directing it into this fear-based energy and transforming it, raising its vibration. So I also started giving... Uh, decrees to Saint Germain for transforming energy. And after I had done that for a couple of months, it suddenly hit me that there was a specific situation from my teenage years. It involved a girl I had a crush on, and it had created really a, a, an emotional wound. I, w I was very uh, affected by this, and if I thought about that situation, I would feel the pain. But now I realize that after having given these decrees, Whenever I was reminded of that situation, the pain was not nearly as intense. It was manageable. I could look at it. And so this means that after having given these decrees for two to three months, I saw some really dramatic effects. And of course, I have been doing these decrees ever since, and I've been using the other techniques, the invocations, especially in later years. And it's just had a tremendous impact on my spiritual path. 
when I look back, I see that there's just no way I could have made the progress I have made if I had not learned how to invoke spiritual energy from the Ascended Masters. It's, it's just amazing how effective it is. You know, and I, I talked in my last talk about how I have um, come to see certain selves. And what I do now, of course, is whenever I come to see a self, I immediately start looking for an invocation or a decree that can address this. So I invoke light from the Ascended Masters to transform the, the energy that was accumulated through that self. And I don't necessarily even do any more in the beginning to look at the self because I just let some time go. And then um, when I feel that the energy is less intense, then I start looking at the self. And so it's, it's just tremendously effective. Um, you know, it's, it's one of these dilemmas when you're doing something like I'm doing, you know. You, you want to share with people what has worked for you. But you want to be careful and not say that the same thing is going to work the same way for everybody else. Because I've experienced over the years that people are different and people need different things. So again, you know, if you feel you need a different way to uh, get spiritual energy, and if you find something that works for you, by all means use it. I can only speak based on my own experience and say, this worked for me. Uh, I would say, if you have if anything I have said in these talks resonates with you, at least give it a try and see how it works for you. There's no guarantee that it will, but you know if the, if the videos appeal to you, it's likely that it will work for you. Now, how do you do all of this? Well, I feel that's too much for me to talk about here. I actually have explained this deeper on the one website, the more universal website called higherawarenesspsychology.com, but I have another website called TranscendenceToolbox.com and on that you will find more of an explanation about who the Ascended Masters are, how to work with them, and you will find a large number of these decrees and invocations whereby you can invoke the light from the Ascended Masters. So if this is something that resonates with you, spend some time checking it out, spend some time experimenting and see what works for you. And so beyond that I don't really want to make any specific uh, recommendations. I want to get back to more universally talking about my experiences on the path. And the next topic I'll talk about is how can we come to see a separate self and dissolve it, let it die.